Well, we got a uh, late night degenerate special here coming up in college football week nine. We're going to break that down for you. We've got three best bets, and some of them might just surprise you here, but they shouldn't since we have three of the best college football handicappers at wagertalk.com on this Friday edition of the college football kickoff show. Double R, one L, Steve Merrill in the house. Trig is here ready to go adam trigger and of course mr robert vino ready to go here on this week nine uh, guys and let's kick it off merrill with no better place to start on a friday than of course the late night degenerate special uh i bring you san jose state and hawaii no doubt going to be the last game on the card enjoy it while you can here i guess because all of this uh, pac-12 late night stuff all going away uh next year but we do have a little late night degenerate special. And how are you looking at this one? Yeah, late night degenerate special. Plus, I'm going to talk about the San Jose State Hawaii game Ooh. while we're at it. No, all seriousness, <laughs> I did a solo video for this. <laughs> I did a solo video for this back on Monday. And I highly recommend people check out these early week videos because the game was minus eight when I did the video. And I said I liked San Jose State. Uh, so I wanted to do a little recap here now that this line has moved quite a bit during the week. It's up to 10 and a half, even 11s out there. Didn't have my 10,000 game simulation done on Monday afternoon. Takes several days to run, but I do have it done now. So I wanted to give that out as well. I have Hawaii losing by 12. So San Jose State on average winning by 12 based on my simulation. So I do still think there's some value at minus 10 and a half, minus 11. Even though I gave it out at minus eight on Monday, yet another reason to hit subscribe and hit the bell for instant alerts when those videos go live each week on Monday and Tuesday. I do think there's still some line value here. And I like the situational setup as well. You're always concerned when a team is traveling to Hawaii without the bye week, without the extra rest, and that is the case here. But I don't think San Jose State can afford to overlook this game. This is a team that started 1-5 and five straight up, but now they're getting some momentum. Back-to-back -back wins the last couple weeks, not only straight up and against the spread, but by 28 and 21 points as less than a touchdown favorite in each game. Now they're taking a step down in class. And another reason I don't think they let up in this game or have any problems with the travel is that they're a run-based offense. Five and a half yards per carry. That's the strength of this offense. Uh, their weakness this year has been a very mediocre run D that gives up five yards per carry. But their pass defense is actually pretty good. Seven and a half yards per pass, yes, but their opponents average eight. Hawaii is averaging just seven. And under second-year head coach Timmy Chang, Timmy, they throw the ball basically every play. They have absolutely no running attack, just 58 yards, just two and a half yards per carry. This is a very one-dimensional offense behind Timmy Chang and his coaching staff. And San Jose State's strength is actually their pass defense. So I like the matchup. I like the situational setup, even with the travel. And despite the move from minus eight up to 10 and a half, 11, uh, there is still some values. I project a 12 point win. So San Jose State or pass, lay it if you're going to play it. 11.59 Eastern. We can't say midnight because then it becomes a Sunday game and mm -hmm. Rob Bino gets very confused. Yes, although it will end Sunday, but that's a whole different conversation there. Uh, <laughs> San Jose State getting it done. For Steve Merrill, and uh, don't forget, if you happen to be new to us here at uh, Wager Talk TV, and if college football content is what you're looking for, nobody, uh, like Steve alluded to there, nobody has more of it than we do all week long. So if you're looking for more game previews, as well as more best bets in these games, make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button for us, and become part of of the Wager Talk TV family as we welcome in Adam Trigger. Ready to roll here, Trig. And a game actually kicking off in a few hours here as Florida Atlantic taking on Charlotte uh, tonight, that being Friday. So tell me, uh, which side are you leaning towards in this big matchup? Yeah, Joe, so we got one game on Friday. I want to make sure it got covered on this show. Um, so I like Florida Atlantic here. You know, it, it might have been a game I would have just glossed over or, or passed, it, it, but I like the spot that both teams come into, and I do think it creates some value uh, and a reason to play on Florida Atlantic if you're going to get involved in the Friday game. So we go back to last week, just not a good game for Daniel Richardson. He's, of course, the backup quarterback for Florida Atlantic that had a phenomenal game and a, a blowout win over South Florida. And then last week he comes back just awful. Um, two interceptions, five sacks. Just a terrible game for him. And, you know, when when you have a game that's that bad, like we've seen him play a couple good ones. So to come out and play that poorly, I, I just feel like he probably bounces back. Even if he doesn't come out and torch Charlotte like he did to USF, if he plays better, 
Florida Atlantic's going to move the ball and, and put some points up. And if they do that, it's really hard to believe that they don't win and probably cover this small number here. Uh, and, and that's, you know, you go to the other side, the Charlotte side, feel like they need a huge defensive game um, to win or cover this spread. They've only exceeded 10 points once in their last four games on offense. Now, you can make the case that, you know, they played Florida, they played SMU, uh, but, you know, the, the one game they scored more than 10 in that stretch was the SMU game. They still lost that game by 18. So, again, I just think, like, you know, you can make the case, okay, well, Charlotte covered some big numbers, Florida, SMU, but they also, you know, they also got shut out by Navy, 14 nothing. a Navy team that I don't think is particularly a, a good football team this year. And then you go back to last week. Charlotte finally gets their win, first win since the, the first week of the season where they beat an FCS school uh, over East Carolina. But it was one of those wins where it took a big defensive effort to win the game 10-7. Um, you know, they win as an underdog. And so now they're going to be kind of expected to turn around. And, you know, you're going to need that kind of defensive effort again, in my opinion here, uh, because I just don't think, I don't think Charlotte's going to score enough points to win a game that there's any sort of scoring output in. Uh, so, you know, Charlotte, like if you watch them offensively, they will be, you know, they'll break a big play occasionally tends to be how they generate their offense, but Florida Atlantic is, is good at, at limiting explosive plays. So, you know, their defense has been good at, at like containing and not giving up like the big sort of dagger type play, which tells me that if, if Charlotte's going to score in this matchup, they're going to need to sustain drives. And I don't have any confidence in the Charlotte offense sustaining drives if you look if you've sort of watched them play the last couple of weeks um you know they just don't sustain much offense so florida atlantic like again the only way charlotte covers this number is in a very low scoring game and just if you with how poorly florida atlantic's offense played last week i think they're going to bounce back a little bit let's say fau scores 21 points here or breaks 20 i think they're going to cover this number without much issue, much issue so i lean toward florida atlantic this one wasn't a client play for me, uh, but the number feels low here, Joe. So if I'm if I'm betting college football on Friday night, I'm betting the Owls. Uh, we'll call it minus three and a half in Florida Atlantic. Yeah, waiting to see if uh, if this thing drops even uh, a little bit more. The buyback is coming at some point uh, here as this thing opened up at six. So let's see if uh, we can't get at the bottom of the barrel. Buy low on FAU here tonight, taking on charlotte and mr rob vino in the house and uh vino what is going on my man you're heading out west too for us i believe in a uh final pac-12 matchup here i i guess because since it's going away and yet it's one of the best conferences uh stanford taking on uh washington what are we looking at in this matchup well we're going to take a look at the over in this one mm. joe and you know it Washington's offense, boy, they're likely to be focused on redeeming themselves. Last week, they didn't score an offensive touchdown. It's almost hard to believe that you could play Arizona State and be Washington with that offense and not score an offensive touchdown. Last week, they scored 15 points, three field goals, and an 89-yard interception return for a touchdown. So I look for them to come out this week and try to redeem themselves. Michael Penix Jr. did throw for 275, but we know the team averages 403 through the air per game, so that's low for them. He had a couple of passes picked off. The Huskies committed four turnovers in that game. What's strange about that is that they only had six turnovers the entire season, six games prior into that one, so six on the season, four last week. You wouldn't expect that to happen again. Um, they made four trips into the red zone last week those four trips and three of those made it all the way to the arizona state seven yard line but what they came away with was three field goals and an interception so again very unlike washington kind of hard to explain they lose time of possession which is not a big deal for them because they strike so quickly however to lose it by almost 15 minutes to ASU, 37-29 to 22-31. That's a big gap in time of possession. Even with the ball that short a period of time, they were able to jam in 10 series. Just didn't go their way last week. Now, more than likely, you can justify that effort and say, you know what, the week before they had that draining shootout with Oregon. Now they come back home. It's homecoming night in Washington. Um, you're a double-digit favorite against a conference team that's bottom of the barrel. 
probably don't have the focus that you're supposed to have. So let's just treat that game as a mirage and think that Washington's, or at least project that Washington's going to come back big offensively this week. Stanford comes in off of a couple of absolute polar opposite results two weeks ago. They're down 29 nothing against Colorado. They make the uh, ridiculous comeback and win 46-43. And overtime last week, they get simply dismantled by UCLA, 42-7. to um, Kind of like the direction they're going, Joe. I mean, Troy Taylor seems like he'll be a good fit for that program offensively at times. You can see them progressing behind quarterback Ashton Daniels. If you look at his last two games, the two that I just mentioned with really different results, Ashton Daniels has been steady, 27 of 45, 60% in both games. Same exact statistical numbers. One game he threw for 396, the other game he threw for 268. So they've got a little bit of juice where offense is concerned. The matchups here, however, would lead you to believe that there's simply no chance for the Stanford defense. They have the 131st ranked pass defense in the nation. And as I mentioned earlier, Washington at 403 passing yards per game. That's number one in the country. So you have one versus 131. To make matters worse, because we know that pass defense is kind of hand in glove, pass rush, pass you know defense on the back end. Washington's only allowed four sacks the entire season. 273 pass attempts for the Huskies, only four sacks. That's crazy. It probably negates any semblance of you know, past defense that Stanford has. They've been able to record eight sacks the last two weeks. They do have 16 on the season, but I would bank on Washington's offensive line having the advantage there. I need points from the other side to get this thing over 60 and a half, and I think the Cardinals offense can get it done here. It's a different style opponent this week. Last week, they faced UCLA, which is one of the best run defenses in the country. They're also a, an extreme sack defense. So at the point of attack, they're tremendous. Washington's not the same. Washington gives up twice as many yards on the ground per game as UCLA does. And Washington, I just talked about how they don't get sacked. They don't sack anybody either. Seven quarterback Man. sacks in seven games. So Ashton Daniels probably has a little bit of time here. I'm calling for a big bounce back out of the Washington offense in the 40-plus range, which is usually what they get you. And I think Stanford can get the 20 or more, which puts this 60 and a half in a spot where we can play it. I'd look for it to hit between 65 and 71 here. So I'm going to play over 60 and a half Washington Stanford. Come on, that, that Arizona State game was head scratching last week <laughs> there uh, against Washington, but looking for a bounce back here to uh, tomorrow, in fact, uh, with Stanford. And now, of course, we've got three best bets coming your way from these guys. And a quick reminder if you happen to have any questions, about the games they just talked about or any of these games coming up in a week nine slate, go ahead, drop them in the comment section as Steve Merrill, Adam Trigger, Rob Vino, they'll be monitoring the section right up until kickoff. So don't be shy. If you got a question, drop it in to the comment section here so we can make it a very profitable week nine along with a couple of best bets. So let's go, Merrill. We're taking it back to you here. You started us off with the late night degenerate special. Are uh, are you going the early slate now for your best bet? What do you got for us? Well, that was the dessert, the last game on the card. I'm going to go to the entree, which is a 7:30 <laughs> Eastern game. We have a lot of earlier appetizers at the 3:30. By the way, my college football <laughs> top 25 video has several 3:30 Eastern games on the board. Both true top 25 matchups are at 3:30 Eastern, and then as I always do, I took some additional games that were just a bit outside. And one of them I'm going to talk about as a free play here for the show, and that's number three, Ohio State, at number 35, Wisconsin. And here's how that works. They got one vote in the additional votes in the AP Top 35. 35 teams got votes, including UNLV for the first time since 2003. So check out that Top 30, 35 video because I do do six games broken down with my power ratings and situational analysis. But let's dig a little deeper into the Ohio State-Wisconsin game. Last week, I had a strong best bet on Ohio State. I gave it for free in my top 25 video. Also had it for my clients at wagertalk.com. I believe I even gave it out earlier in the week here on the college football show last Tuesday. So lots of ways that people got that Ohio State winner. And one of the reasons I liked them is my projection had them as a nine-point favorite. They were only laying four. Penn State was an extreme public underdog. And James Franklin has a tendency to beat up on weak teams and struggle against good teams. And that's exactly how it played out. But I do think this is a potentially dangerous spot now for Ohio State. 
Uh, let's first look at my 10,000 game simulation through the database 10,000 times. On average, I've got Ohio State winning this game by 13. Pretty close to the point spread. It's 14 and a half, but we all know 14 is an extremely key number. So at 14 and a half or more, there is some solid line value with Wisconsin. And that's just a normal situation that does not factor in the possible flat spot here for Ohio State, which I think is a real concern after a huge top 10 win at home. And by the way, they have Rutgers on deck. That might sound silly, but Rutgers mm. is also getting some additional votes in the AP poll as well. So I think this is a dangerous road spot. And Wisconsin qualifies as a good defensive dog with a good running game. That's what we call a live dog. They've got to keep this game close. Look, if they get down by a couple scores early, they're in big trouble because they don't throw the ball well. But if Ohio State comes in a little hungover, a little flat, I think Wisconsin can keep this game close. They run for five yards per carry. They give up only 18 points a game. They give up only 14 and a half points per game at home this year in four home games. And they're getting 14 and a half. And the line's a bit too high, plus the potential flat spot. It all adds up to a solid situational play, I think, on the Wisconsin Badgers at plus 14 and a half or more. 7.30 Eastern on NBC Saturday night. And don't forget, if you want my official college football best bets, I've got three of them loaded already on my page, even looking at some more. Huge NFL card on Sunday. NFL on a 29 sides run going back to August. NBA is here. Nobody has won more on NBA sides the last two years at wagertalk.com. I'm ranked number one there. Not a bad time to get an all sports, all access. Try a three day for just 49. It's an instant $20 discount. We have the rest of 2023 for $7 a day or a full year special for just $3 a day. All the promo codes, all the special prices are on my page right now. Steve Merrill, wagertalk.com. So, uh, 10 and 0, by the way, Wisconsin, uh, when getting six or more as a dog at home. And didn't Luke Fickle go? Didn't he play at Ohio State? If I'm, I know he coached there, but wasn't he an actual player? At Ohio State, I'm fairly certain this is his alma mater, and I'm pretty sure this is going to be uh, maybe one of the biggest games for him since Ohio State got uh, boat raced his Cincinnati squad back, uh, remember that, a couple of years ago, 42 to nothing. So uh, homecoming for Luke Fickle, boy, would he love to stick it right to them. Uh, let's go here, Trig, uh, and I can't wait to see it happen because they may just win outright. Uh, let me see here, Trig. I love this player of yours here, Western Michigan, taking uh, taking on, I believe, uh, what do we got, uh, Eastern Michigan here. And this is going to be uh, two and a half, maybe three right now, Eastern Michigan, the home dog. Usually pretty good spot to back Eastern Michigan in a dog roll. Are you buying that, though, in this matchup? No, Joe, I like the favorite here. And, um, you know, I, I bet quite a bit of Mac football um it's a conference that's somewhat close to me regionally i tend to do okay in this conference had a nice winner uh with toledo last week four percenter and i'm going to come back with a four percent play on western michigan here I, admittedly this is a team that i wasn't really on my radar much coming into the season relative to some of the other mac teams i've talked about a bunch uh but they keep kind of like emerging in a positive light for me uh they came up here earlier to play syracuse like back in september um i thought that was Hughes was in there you know, can do no wrong era at the time, Joe, where they just scored on every possession. And it was like a very deceiving final score because Syracuse, um, you know, they paid off every single drive and it, it looks like more of a blowout than it was. Go to the next week, um, you know, Iowa, they, they played a really good first half against Iowa, fell apart in the second half, but that was when Iowa was a little bit healthier and it's a great Iowa defense. Following week, Toledo team, I've, I've really paid close attention to. And Western Michigan, yes, they fell apart in the second half of that game as well, but they still put up 400 yards of total offense. And last week when I'm doing my research on Mississippi State, it ended up being a 4 percenter for me. Uh, there's Western Michigan again with another 400-plus yards of total offense against uh, Mississippi State in Starkville in a game where if you just cover up the final score, which wasn't even that lopsided, 41-28, it looked like a pretty even game. Uh, and then you go to their MAC game so far this year. They have a win over Ball State. I talked about the Toledo loss where they led by 10 at halftime. And the other two games are against Ohio and Miami of Ohio, two of the better teams in this conference. And they were competitive in both of them. So, you know, relative to what the point spreads have been, Western Michigan really hasn't played badly all season. I mean, you could make a, a case that they have been pretty good, you know, relative to, to their competition in just about every game. Eastern Michigan, on the other hand, I mean, if we're just talking about the eye test and watching these teams play, Eastern Michigan is not a good football team. 
Um, I, I made the mistake, a mistake of, of backing them against Jacksonville State earlier this year. They didn't score a single point. Uh, they, the UMass Eastern Michigan game was absolutely dreadful. This offense is horrible. Uh, Austin Smith might be the worst starting quarterback in the FBS that's, that was supposed to be a starting quarterback. Like He's not just like a backup that's been thrust into the starter role. Um, they don't move the football. And, you know, I've always liked Chris Creighton as a coach. His teams play hard, but this team just isn't very good. I like to, to fade these teams with the late bye week. So it was another thing that I was kind of looking at this week. Now, both of them have late bye weeks. Uh, next week is, is going to be their bye. Uh, but I think I'd rather have the, the all around better team here in Western Michigan, as opposed to an Eastern Michigan team that's going to really need their defense to make a bunch of plays to, uh, you know, to, to keep them in the game or, or to win the game. Uh, I thought Eastern Michigan sort of fizzled out in the Northern Illinois game last week. And so I'm hoping that they're maybe a little bit fatigued because if Eastern Michigan is not getting stops, I think they're going to get blown out. Western Michigan is just is a superior team here. And I'm going to lay three with what I think is the, is the far better team. Uh, so I took Western Michigan minus the three points. I like them to win this one by at least a field goal. And I, I think they win it comfortably. So you're saying maybe Eastern Michigan's defense a little overrated given the fact they've played Howard, UMass, Central Michigan, Ball State, Kent State, go down the list. They've played nobody. And I love, they got the best quarterback too in Hayden Wolf that nobody talks about. Uh, former sure. Old Dominion uh, QB. I, you know, I did the very simple decision here with Western Michigan. I'm with you 100% on that one. Now, Rob Vino. You, uh, last but not least here, because uh, you two coming over the top here with a best bet for us. Which way are you looking here? A lot of different ways uh, for you. Either way, I'm thinking it's probably an over. I could be wrong. But tell me, where are you going here, Vino, with this one? <laughs> How dare I trust Jimbo Fisher to lay double digits, Joe? But that's what I'm going to do here. Um, <laughs> Jimbo. We're going we're gonna to play A&M. Um, and I would say 75% of it is a fade of South Carolina at this point in time. Uh, the South Carolina offense last week when they took the field against Missouri, it was their eighth game of the season. It was their eighth different offensive line combination. They've just been decimated across the front. You saw it last week. Every time they got something going, Missouri would just apply pressure. I think Mizzou had five sacks in that game. Anytime South Carolina got you know into Missouri territory, Mizzou could easily turn what could be a touchdown drive into a field goal drive because they would just pressure Spencer Rattler, who's running for his life on almost every drop back attempt. The team can't run the football because they can't block for the run. Thus, they're in bad down and distance and other teams tee off. And that's good for A&M because if there's one thing they can do, it's tee off on the quarterback. They've got 29 sacks already this mm. season, one of your best pass rushes in college football. So I don't think that matchup works in any way, shape, or form for the Gamecocks. And as the season wears down, we're into the back third now. Um, it just grinds on your team, on your quarterback, on your defense. So I think A&M has a huge advantage there. If you add to that, Joe, the list of injuries to South Carolina productive mm. wide receivers, and they have nobody to throw the ball to anymore. Um, Wells out, Brown out, the get now questionable. They just don't have any guys left uh, on that team. So it's a difficult road for the South Carolina offense going to College Station here this week. Last week against Missouri, they had the ball 11 times on offense. One time they made it inside the red zone. Ten times they didn't. So, again, that's not a way to score a lot of points. Thus, the shot here with A&M laying 15 and a half. A&M is off a of bye week had time to get healthy, had time to prepare. They're off back-to-back -back losses. They should come out enthused and fired up here in this game. Max Johnson, the quarterback, along with the running game, gets to face the South Carolina defense that if you take out Furman, the FCS team that South Carolina's played this year, and just look at the six FBS opponents versus South Carolina, those six offenses have scored 33.5 points per game and average 467.2 yards per game. Those are huge numbers. The defense, as I mentioned earlier, grinding down as the season wears down because the offense just can't get it done at this point in time. Those numbers aren't skewed where total yardage is concerned. Every single team, every FBS team that's played South Carolina this year has gotten 418 total yards or more in their game. So 
I, I think A&M should be good offensively here. They've certainly got some wide receivers that can produce, much like Missouri had last week with Luther Bradley, um, Theo Weiss and company. If you just look at A&M home games this year, and I get it hasn't been against the best opposition, but South Carolina doesn't rank as the best type of opposition anymore this late in the season with all their injuries. A&M's played three home games, beat Auburn by 17, 27-10, beat New Mexico 52-10, beat uh, Louisiana Monroe 47-3. Three home games, cumulative score 126-23. to I think A&M gets another big home win here as they get ready to go down the home stretch. Um, give me A&M minus 15 and a half. I could see something in the range of 37, 13, something like that looks good to me. Yeah, uh, you know, Jimbo just itching for another one of those giant blowouts there to flex on uh, everyone. You know it's coming there. So why not against uh, a hobbled South Carolina team? And there you got it. Three big game breakdowns, including a game tonight. Don't forget their uh, Friday night with FAU and Charlotte. And, of course, three best bets. But we're not done yet. If you weren't here earlier, if you love college football content and it's what you're looking for, game previews, nobody's got more of it than we do here at Wager Talk TV. If you click on that video on your screen right now, You'll have access to all the week nine college football matchups, plus the best bets to go along with it. So make sure you hit that subscribe button as well, and then come back and join us again. We'll be back on Monday with another edition of the college football kickoff show. Best of luck with all your plays this weekend. We'll talk to you again soon.